Hello, everybody. My name is Joseph Campana. I am a professor in the Department of English at Rice University, um, and I'm really pleased to be the director of the Center for Environmental Studies and also the co-director of the Environmental Studies Curriculum, um, which I co-direct with Richard Johnson, um, the director of administrative the director of the Administrative Center for Sustainability and Energy Management, and I work a lot with him, which is why I'm giving him a shout out, though he's not right in front of you right now. Um, we're so pleased to introduce our new series, Planet Now, Conversations in Environmental Studies. Um, please forgive tonight a little bit of extra preamble um, because it's our first event and we really want to sort of let you know what's been going on. Um, we're so excited to have Professors Julie Z and Joni Adamson with us for our first event, What is Environmental Justice? Um, no one person wrote the book on environmental justice. It's importantly a collaborative, multi-voiced, multi-generational conversation um, and movement with so many important thinkers and writers and activists. However, both Julie Z and Joni Addison have written such important books and collections and essays on the subject. We're so lucky to be in conversation with them tonight. Um, and I'm also so pleased to be working um, not only on the whole series with Richard Johnson and my other colleagues, but also tonight with Professor Gisela Hefes of the Department of uh, Modern and Classical Literatures and Cultures. She curated this particular session tonight, and you'll hear more from her soon. Um, and another this fall, She'll be introducing our speakers in a moment um, and starting the conversation. Um, and I should say about Gisela, she is an incredibly accomplished specialist in Argentine literature and culture, an accomplished fiction writer and eco-critic. Um, and she also launched our first environmental justice course in the ENST program, um, which I just want to say, and I said this to some of these sort of speakers earlier, it's important to say that that course and a lot of the things that we're doing come directly from student demand. Um, it's our undergraduates who have stepped up to say that it's really important to have conversations about the environment, but also about environmental justice in our curriculum, and we're grateful to them um, for the encouragement. So the overall series Planet Now, we want to ensure invigorating conversations about the environment and energy, ecology, and climate amidst our complicated moment right now. Um, and we want to emphasize a habit of conversation about important questions across disciplines and points of view, because you need habits of conversation to have good conversations. Um, we wanted to create a sort of virtual sort of webinar series that would be broad and accessible, and that would have uses for right now when it's not really safe for us to gather together in person, but also some important uses after afterwards. And our intention is to make as many of these as available as possible afterward on our website. Before we begin, um, I need to make some acknowledgments. Um, First of all, it's really important to say our event here is virtual, um, but we're at Rice University in the sprawling city of Houston, Texas on the Gulf Coast. And we must acknowledge that we live um, and work and spend our time on the ancestral lands of the Karankawa, the Sana, the Atacapa, and the Tonkawa. It's also important to recognize at this moment that we are the recipients of incredibly good fortune in not being hit nearly by Hurricane Laura, but others were not so lucky, right? Further up the coast, our neighbors in Port Arthur and Beaumont, which have dealt with so much and so much storm over the last couple decades, right? Um, our own city, right, which suffered so much in Hurricane Harvey. Um, and our neighbors along the coast in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I also want to say, especially since our guests hail from sort of Western states, and because we are all looking at the news right now, I hope um, not only extreme heat on the rise everywhere, but the incredible um, and devastating fires in California and Oregon and Washington, um, and any conversation we have directly and indirectly, that's the environment we're in and that we have to think about. And we're trying to think very much about others elsewhere and hope everyone is as safe um, and as healthy as possible. I'd like to make a few institutional acknowledgments. Um, as I said, I've had the great pleasure of working with my colleague Richard Johnson and other colleagues at the Center for Environmental Studies on that. Um, the Center for Environmental Studies is located in the schools of humanity, of the humanities and architecture. I'm so grateful to Deans Kathleen Canning and John Kasparian for their support. Um, within the school, John Waterhouse, make sure all of our events are getting to everyone um, and that we sort of look right and sort of proper for, for our conversation 
conversations. Um, and Tara Usli, who is an administrative um, liaison in the, in the School of Humanities for the center and does an incredible amount of work. We're really grateful for all of that. We enjoy the support of the Humanities Research Center, especially um, in the form of uh, a major grant from the Mellon Foundation, the Deluvial Houston grant, which directly supports this event and some of the others. Um, it's a pleasure to work with uh, Farez El Dada and Melissa Baylor on that grant because um, as it emerged as, as a grant thinking about post Harvey Houston, our current moments makes us think increasingly um, about two issues within the sort of context of post Harvey Houston anyway, which are environmental justice and environmental health. Um, and it's important that we're sort of the, the, the fortunate beneficiaries of that grant from the Mellon Foundation part of which includes hiring a recent PhD as our project manager to work on a lot of things at the center in the HRC, Sean Smith, the recent PhD in history and an environmental historian himself. We're really grateful for that. Um, we're also grateful for the support of the recently sort of christened department of um, uh, modern and classical uh, literatures and cultures, which is joined to support a number of events. Our events are sort of arranged in conversation with a lot of other units at Rice. We want that to be a founding principle of this too, that we are sort of sharing the, the work and the sort of the choices and the audiences. We've, um, in the series that I'll talk about at, towards the end of this, the rest of the events for this fall, we've worked with um, um, the program in politics, law, and social thought, uh, the Center for African and African American Studies and others, and we look forward to working with other units sort of as we move forward with Planet Now. Um, I just want to end saying one thing before I turn it over to my, uh, my esteemed colleague Gisela. I just want to sort of mention a date, February 16, 1994. I was a sophomore in college um, and I was grateful to be reminded um, by Julie Z in her fantastic book on environmental justice that that was the date Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 12898, affirming the importance of environmental justice for all departments of the federal government, um, and to, that, that this would be something that all of the agencies should attend to. Um, and there is still, as far as I can tell, um, an EPA office for environmental justice. Um, I'm reminded of that, and I'm glad to be reminded of that for a number of reasons. It also makes me think of something that we have to think about reading, say, Nathaniel Rich's work, Losing Earth, reminding us that much of what we've needed to know, we knew several decades ago. And as I think about that date, 1994, and as I think about 2020, um, I think about the fact that where we were is still where we are very often, right? Um, that we have to think about futures, but also to realize the future has arrived in many forms and not all the ones that we would prefer. Um, and as as such, there's no better time to ask the question, what is environmental justice now? Because we need to be asking ourselves that question and trying to answer it each and every day. So I'm really excited for this conversation. I'm grateful to everyone who made this possible and to our fantastic guests. Let me now turn it over to Gisela. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm going to follow up on what uh, Joe just said uh, and I want to say uh, I'm very thankful first to the Center for Environmental Studies, in particular uh, the Diluvial Houston Initiative, through which I was able to put together this wonderful panel. Uh, I'm also very thankful to the Humanities Research Center and the School of Humanities for their continuous support. Um, I am so delighted and so honored to be here with two scholars I admire so much. Uh, in fact, this conversation is part of the curriculum of my environmental justice class where we had the privilege to discuss many of the ideas and contributions both Johnny and Julie made to the field of environmental humanities and more specifically environmental justice in our daily discussion. Uh, Johnny Adamson is president Professor of Environmental Humanities in the Department of English and Director of the Environmental Humanities Initiative at the Julie Ann Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University. She writes on environmental justice, the centrality of the environmental humanities to the sustainability sciences, the design of desirable, desirable futures, 
indigenous literatures and scientific literacies, the rights of nature movement, and the food justice movement. Her research has been supported but by many awards and grants, including the 2019 Benjamin Duke Fellowship at the National Humanities Center. Julie Z is a professor of American Studies at UC Davis. She's also the founding director of the Environmental Justice Project for UC Davis John Muir Institute for the Environment. Her research investigates environmental justice and in environmental inequality, culture and environment, race, gender and power, and urban community health and activism, and has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the American Studies Association, and the UC Humanities Research Institute. Her most recent book, it came out now in 2020, Env Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger, examines mobilizations of movements from protests at Standing Rock to activism in Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria and explores this position, deregulation, privatization, and inequality. It claims that environmental justice movements fight, survive, love, and create in the face of violence that challenges the conditions of the life itself. Thank you so much, Johnny and Julie, for being here. So I wanted to start the conversation uh, asking a very simple question. What is environmental justice? Uh, what does it mean today? And why is so relevant? Maybe, uh, Johnny, would you like to go first and then you can be followed by Julie? Thank you, Gisela, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank uh, the Center for Environmental uh, Studies at Rice University for this in invitation. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the homelands of the Akimel Uptam and the Peeposh peoples in Arizona. Um, to answer this question, I think I'm really, really aware of the amazing work that Julia has done in um, environmental justice in a moment of danger. And so um, I, I have a sense of what she might speak about. And so what I think I'll do it, to answer this question is talk to you a little bit from my um, current project on global syndemic. I think that um, this work is trying to sort of tease out where we've come from when we were speaking about environmental justice in the late 90s and early 2000s to, to what we know now in this age of the novel coronavirus. So I'm gonna to speak to you a little bit about, uh, uh, from a little essay that I've just written called From Ecology to Syndemic, Accounting for the Synergy of Epidemics. The definition of ecology has become a truism. Everything is connected to everything else. In the early 1980s, the environmental justice movement built on this idea by emphasizing that there is no such thing as the quote unquote natural world unconnected from human activities. As defined in the Environmental Justice Reader, which I co-edited, environment was the place where humans and non-humans lived, worked, and played in dynamic interactions. Environmental justice spokespersons such as Robert Bullard, called upon environmentalists concerned for pristine wilderness to see the siting of polluting industries in communities of color as connected to long histories of imperialism, slavery, and extractive practices in agricultural, agriculture, logging, mining, and fishing. One of the watershed documents produced by movement leaders at the 17 Principles of Envi Environmental Justice called for a political, economic, and cultural liberation denied for over 500 years to colonized and uh, oppressed peoples. In some of my early work, I uh, referenced Anna Castillo's novel, So Far From God, which captures the spirit of that early environmental justice movement in her representation of a New Mexican community where a toxic factory has been cited. Latinx and Navajo mothers who have lost children to toxins released into their water, air, and soil transform a Catholic Way of the Cross religious procession into an environmental justice event. At each stop in the procession, they lament babies born with brain damage 
and cancer clusters they understand to be linked to the toxins being released by the factories located near their community. We care about saving the whales and the rainforest, they declare, but we as a people are being limited from, eliminated from the ecosystem too, unquote. So this scene helps to illuminate why many uh, communities calling for environmental justice in the late 19, 1990s are the same communities that today are calling for fair policing after the death of George Floyd um, in, in Minneapolis in 2020, May 2020. Castillo's fictional mothers evoke the unbearable grief now being felt around the world for Floyd who called out for his mama in the last minutes of his life. His words and his death have invoked the grief of black and brown mothers, fathers, brothers, and sisters who have lost family members and members to police violence um, and also now to COVID-19. These mothers are passionately about the need for a radical anti-racist, anti-patriarchal re response to white privilege and the very real threats menacing even when passively expressed, that are the social dynamics posed to the health, well-being, and the very lives of people of color. They have joined with people around the world who are spilling out into the streets to call for deep and honest reflection on the connections between discrimination, racialized siting of polluting industries, and the extractive practices that are interrupting biospheric processes in ways that now give expression to a spreading uh, pandemic. The discriminatory practices that did target minority communities for violent policing and polluting industries are, in many cases, effectively the same practices that are putting Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities at heightened risk for COVID-19. While statistically, we have an incomplete picture of the toll of COVID-19, uh, the existing data as analyzed uh, by the APM Research Lab reveals inequities when viewed by race. According to their research, Black Americans are dying at 2.4% higher than whites, uh, while Indigenous Americans are dying at rates eight times higher. And I'll just stop, um, I'll just stop there just to point out that I'm writing about this concept of global syndemic, which is synchronous epidemics. And I believe that these epidemics are the racism, environmental racism, polluting um, industries, uh, violent police, et cetera, that all of these events, recent events, COVID-19 and what happened in Minneapolis have just made more and more um, um, visible to us. So in the environmental justice movement, and those of us who, who as scholars have been looking at environmental justice or working with activists in the environmental justice movement, uh, we, we have been talking about these things for quite a, quite a number of years, but all of these recent events have made them, I think, maybe more visible to the general public. And so when we talk about environmental justice today, these are the linked epidemics or synchronous epidemics that I think we're talking about. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Joni. Um, and thank you, Gisela and um, the center for this invitation. Um, when we think about the, what is the question of environmental justice, I think many of us um, know what environmental injustice looks like. Um, it's easier to talk about what is grotesque examples of, um, of of violence and environmental inequality. And both Joni and I have been working in collaboration with community movements and indigenous peoples and people of color for since the mid 1990s when this movement started to become named as environmental justice movements. Um, the movement and the principles of environmental justice that Joni mentioned really articulated um, a problem of environmental racism. Um, first and foremost, and being connected out of a history of the civil rights movement. Um, this concept of environmental injustice is, is much um, broader also than just the civil rights movement and 1990s or even the 1960s. 
And so the very fundamental ideas of um, modernity and what kind of society we live in now um, in a sort of post-colonial global world. Um, and so I think that, um, it, you know, that I've been trying to uh, work with environmental justice movements and thinking about environmental justice for, I guess at this point, 25 years since I started as a student activist that was moved by you know, the, the movements that were really generating um, in the 90s around environmental racism and environmental injustice. And when I say the environmental justice movement is broader, I don't mean that in a, it's been subsumed or, or gone past. I think environmental justice and climate justice you know, are very, very interconnected. Um, and so this question of what is environmental justice, I think many of us are familiar with the problems. And as Joni said, more and more people are aware of the problems um, and how horrific and violent and, and um, death producing they are. And some of that is because of social movements and so on. I can say now in the 90s, you know, before GIS, you know, I used to see like transparencies where people would put racial demographics and lead poisoning rates, you know, and you'd have to sort of make an empirical argument that there were disparities, racial disparities. I think that, you know, we don't, we're not really in a context right now where empirical documentation of these problems is the issue. It's more what we do with it. And that's how we come back to the, the title of your series, Planet Now. I mean, the urgency of the now, I think is what really is why more and more students are demanding to learn about environmental justice in their curriculums. They're, they're seeing, and I see this in my own students, a mismatch between what they're reading about um, on social media, what they're concerned about um, in climate change, and what they're learning in the classrooms. And so I really applaud the students and you know, the, the, the broader public for you know, saying, okay, well, we want to understand why and how are we, how did we get here? What can we do about it? And so environmental justice has always been a very responsive to concrete real life and death problems and also very problem oriented to say, okay, well, what can we do to try to um, ameliorate them? Um, in terms of, uh, I talked about this book, you know, that just came out in January, um, Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger. And so this is an attempt to sort of synthesize the environmental justice movement, but um, using kind of case studies and keywords. Because now, you know, we all know about Standing Rock, we all know about Flint, um, but there are other cases that aren't as familiar. Um, and so I talk about water um, inequality and other um, inequalities in the Central Valley region of California. I talk about Hurricane um, Katrina as opening up, I think, um, in a lot of ways, this moment that we're in. And so my, uh, my chapter on environmental disasters um, looks at Hurricane Katrina um, and ends with Hurricane Maria. But then I also talk a lot in that chapter about um, this answers, you know, your question about what is environmental justice. I think that it's an articulation of these problems, but it's also a, a solution oriented, but also an affective or emotional kind of sphere saying, you know, we understand these problems and, and there's a feeling of what environmental justice movements fight for. Um, and that feeling can also be generated through culture, through songs, through music. And so culture is a big part of the um, feeling and the importance of environmental justice movements. And I think that's actually kind of one of the interesting things about the moment we're in. The reason why more people are interested in environmental justice is because we're just surrounded by so much injustice of all types. And this is Joni's point about um, the inter, connections between these problems. Environmental justice has, movements have always said that their problems were connected, that racism was tied to pollution and social and environmental problems were linked. Um, but at the same time, environmental justice movements have been fighting for justice. However, that's defined um, for a very long time. And so I think that's part of the importance of environmental justice. It's actually in the fight itself and in the refusal to, to just wither away in the face of um, state violence, corporate violence, and so on. Um, and so, you know, I would just say, you know, that 
environmental justice advocates and justice advocates more broadly are right. They were right in the 90s. And scientists were right, climate scientists in particular. You know, so if we know that the scientists and the justice advocates are right, why do we, why are we surprised that we are where we're, we are? So I think justice, um, environmental justice is a freedom movement and it's not an exceptional freedom movement, it's a connected freedom movement. And what the freedom means is what is at stake. So, you know, there, there, there's negative freedoms like freedom from, and then there's positive, you know, freedoms. Um, and so I think that's partially where I like to think about where environmental justice helps us understand this moment of extreme um, violence that we're in. And, and the culture of environmental justice is as important a part that you can't separate the culture and the social movement organizing. The culture is a part of the social movement organizing. And so what is environmental justice to me personally? I like to listen to Stevie Wonder. He is my hero. And the day he dies will be a very sad day. But he wrote a song in 1975 called Saturn. And if you haven't heard that song, you should listen to it. But um, he opens and it says, packing my bags, going away to a place where the air is clean on Saturn. There's no sense to sit and watch people die. We don't fight our wars the way you do. We put back all the things we use. On Saturn, there's no sense to keep on doing such crimes, end quote. So I think we're, what we're in right now is a place of unclean air, literally. You know, I'm in California. The entire West Coast is covered in unclean air. Violence, war, um, extreme um, extractive capitalism and consumerism, now pandemic, authoritarianism that is not, that is global. Um, and so I think, you know, this idea of, um, we are fighting on so many fronts, but environmental justice movements and justice movements have always fought on so many fronts. And so that's why I think there's an urgency to learn from the movements themselves. I think I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, Julie. And uh, thank you, Johnny. Uh, this is so wonderful and this is so important. Uh, these are some of the issues we have been covering in class and I'm sure we're gonna to discuss tomorrow as well. Uh, I just wanted to ask you uh, if you could uh, talk a little bit about the implications of your work in a broadly sense uh, in the context of environmental justice. Uh, you both mentioned that you do some uh, uh, work outside of the classroom, you work with communities. And I think that's so key, so important in the context of environmental justice to bring it out of the classroom, to bring it out to the communities, uh, to be more activist. So if you could uh, both talk a little bit about that, uh, maybe now Judy, you go first. I know you just talk a lot, but uh, we're gonna alternate and then I pass it on to Johnny. Yeah, I mean, I came out as a student activist um, and um, I've been working with the same, you know, community activists um, for up to two decades. And actually the book, the book proceeds go to two organizations that I've worked with um, for, for um, a long time. Um, environmental justice is always an outward looking thing. And so as an academic field, it's not just in one area it's also very, very interdisciplinary and engaged with the community. So I think environmental justice by its very beating heart is interdisciplinary and social justice oriented. Um, and I, I edited a collection called Sustainability Approaches to Social Power in which we argue that sustainability doesn't mean anything unless it's interdisciplinary and social justice oriented. Um, and so I think you know, for me, I've done more cultural or humanities or public humanities work, but I've also been in conversations and in interdisciplinary groups with scientists and engineers and um, water scientists and so on. So um, environmental justice is always an outward looking um, and change oriented um, field. And I think that, you know, that is part of the, um, 
uh, the importance of the worldview, you know, of being connected, you know, and I think now we understand why, how, why and how everything is connected. And I don't mean that just as this like, you know, oh, we're all connected, like hippie, you know, kind of thing. I mean, literally we're connected, you know, when I remember reading about Hurricane Katrina, I remember reading environmental justice and climate change. Um, there was an organization in the late 90s that talked about what the impact of climate change would be on hurricanes. And I didn't grow up when people were talking about climate change. I never even heard of climate change. You know, that's my age. And, you know, it's different now for young people who've grown up with it. But I remember reading this fact sheet about what a hurricane would do in New Orleans. And I remember thinking, that can't happen. You know, that cannot happen. You know, my mind couldn't imagine the dystopianism of what happened in Hurricane Katrina, what was proven to happen, and what has happened multiple hurricanes since. You know, you talked about Harvey. I'm from New York, so Hurricane Sandy. I have been reading about what climate scientists have been saying about wildfires and heat waves for a long time, and what they've been saying about global climate migrations, you know? So why are we, why do we act I think what the moment of extreme injustice and social inequality that we have right now blows out that kind of innocence that I had in the mid 90s about no that cannot happen that is that's a dystopian novel you know to to be a literary person you know and so I think what justice activists um do is that they have lived through and are living through things and now everybody's experiencing those conditions of environmental in, uh, injustices, you know, the inability to breathe, you know, the conditions that used to be very, very narrow, you know, like asthma was a racial dispropor racially disproportionate problem. Well, you know, when you have the entire West Coast covered in air, asthma then becomes a not racially disproportionate problem, except it is also still worse for the people who already were vulnerable. To it. So um, the expansion of the problems, you know, um, I think is what um, the implications and why the importance of why we have to talk across silos and across campus and community um, to the community members that are really the at the foreground of thinking about what the stakes are, the literal life and sta death stakes of I can't breathe, you know, being a condition of asthma. But then being what, I think I read there were 137 police incidents where the, a person, most, most often a person of color, a black, Latino, or indigenous person said, I can't breathe before they were killed, you know? And connecting that to um, when Khashoggi was killed in Saudi Arabia, you know, an oil despot that the US is, you know, very in, connected to. And so thinking about oil economies and authoritarianism, you know, what environmental justice does is to demand a condition of life and health that is denied to people and denied now to more and more people in the face of climate change. And so I think what environmental justice does is imagine the worst and still fights for the best. And I think that's a really powerful um, uh, uh, framework for me. It remains powerful for me. So thank you, Julie. Um, I think that the, well, I hope that the implication of my work has been all about intergenerational justice. Um, my comadre, Leal, my teacher, uh, worked in on the U.S.-Mexico border. She was a person who worked with uh, women in the Maquilas on the south side of the border to, on environmental justice issues, mostly issues of toxins. And um, we very serendipitous, serendipitously came together in the late 90s and she was my teacher. And one of the things that she always told me was that it's all about the youth. It's all, all about the youth. And so we never had an action. We never had a meeting 
that did not involve young people. So she was always training young people to, to be the next generation to come up behind her. And she passed away about four years ago. And, and you know, when I think about everything that we're learning about um, environmental justice and how we're connecting it to I can't breathe and violent policing, she actually died of asthma, but her asthma was not caused by um, you know, living next to a, a bus um, depot or anything like that. Her asthma was call, caused by going to so many different a actions in which um, tear gas was deployed. And she breathed in the tear gas. And, and, and so in a sense, her death four years ago was, can be attributed you know, to some of the same kinds of I can't breathe issues. So she was going to um, actions that had to do with the Latinx movements around um, agricultural workers and, and then later around the Maquilas. But you know, um, some of that same, same, some of those same processes were involved you know, when she passed away. But she always was bringing in the youth. And so as an academic, I was, you know, always interested in making sure that um, we were always bringing up, you know, people behind us. So, I, I mean, one of my first great memories of working with Julie was, Julie, when you were a graduate student, we, we brought you to the ASLI conference, you know, and so, you know, bringing younger scholars to, the, to, to conferences and making sure, you know, that you find, you find funding to, to bring them in if, you know, if they, um, need some extra funding, or, but always making sure that you're mentoring and uh, mentoring the next generation. And so if there's a sort of activist um, implication to my work, I hope, I hope it's that I've always been trying to sort of, you know, make sure that that next generation is going to be um, in place, f uh, both in the academy and also in, in community. Academically, I hope that the implication of my work is that I have um, been trying to work with indigenous communities um, in Arizona and outside of Arizona in Latin America to to sort sort of show as to, to use Julie's words that um, she used earlier that we have we've always known these things we've been knowing these things for many many decades even hundreds of years so even as far as 500 years there was no mystery about why were these colonizers, why were these imperial colonizers coming here? They were coming here for resources, they were coming here to enrich themselves, and, and the people that they were, um, um, you know, imposing on were not mystified about why they were cutting down the forest and why they were digging up, digging up the minerals. And so this has been an ongoing movement for over 500 years. And um, I hope that one of the sort of academic implications of my work with indigenous oral traditions and indigenous cosmologies is that um, indigenous co cosmologies have embodied um, these really complex and uh, scientific literacies in stories. Maybe the stories were about gods or coyotes or raven or whatever the stories were about, but they were not quote unquote mythology. Rather, they were these really, really complex um, scientific literacies that, that taught people how things were connected and how things work together. So that when something was, um, you know, bumped bumped out of balance, um, there was an implication of, of what would happen um, as a result of that. So from, from, for over 500 years, we have been knowing these things. And, in, and, in, and Julie says in her book, you, um, and I really like the way you say this in your book, um, Julie, that um, the environmental justice movement has to sort of start from indigenous and black ecologies. And you know, um, it has to start from knowing what has happened with indigenous peoples here in America, but also African people in Africa, in this continent. And so, I hope that that implication of my ac the academic side of my work is just bringing more um, awareness of why we have to start there uh, when we talk about environmental justice.
Thank you, uh, Johnny, and, and thank you, uh, Julie, for your answer. I just want to uh, make a little comment here uh, from uh, Julie. Something that struck me in your book uh, is you quote someone who says, um, the system is not broken. The system was designed to be broken. That struck me because it is something that it is uh, really like a, a different <laughs> angle to the whole problem. It's not that something went wrong. It was, it's just has been born like this in order to perpetuate a system of uh, environmental uh, racism and injustice. And something that really struck me too is uh, about the I can breathe is that if you uh, are familiar with some of the protests in the uh, in the Andes, for instance, they also can breathe when they oppose uh, the mining projects that come to the to the Andes, and they uh, they go on and 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 fight uh, for their right to 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 stay in the land and not be displaced. Uh, they are uh, repressed with uh, tear gas and the same means that we're seeing here. And they say the same, I can't breathe. So that also uh, shows something very interesting that we discussed in class, that is uh, the global south, right? And the global north uh, have a lot of similarities. Is the local communities of the global north have similarities with uh, many of the uh, environmental injustice and social injustice that we witness uh, many times in the uh, in the global south. So that's kind of like a parallelism that I wanted to draw. Uh, I'm looking at the time and I really would like to ask you both, what are you working on uh, right now? I know that you're working on very fascinating projects and uh, if you could uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the research project that you're working on and also in on the pieces that you're writing, uh, that will be wonderful. Um, Johnny, maybe you wanna go first now, and then Julie. Um, well, <clears throat> I, I would say that early in my teaching career, I learned as, as a professor teaching in a red state that, um, that there was a lot of resistance to the word environmentalism and even in environmental justice. But I learned, I learned through my teaching that if you, if you converted everything that you wanted to teach and everything you wanted to say into a conversation around food, you could actually convey a sense of hope in your class. So students, students can learn everything about the contributions of agriculture to climate, climate change, they can learn everything about the contribution of toxins in the form of pesticides and herbicides uh, to climate change and, and still allow the conversation to be civil if what you're talking about is food. Since everybody has to eat and everybody has to you know, have nourishment. But you can also fold into those conversations um, really complex discussions about why there are you know, um, nutritional um, injustices, uh, food deserts, and uh, food insecurities around the world. And so in Arizona, one of the things we have looked at in my classes on food justice, and um, the reason why I'm talking about food justice right now is because my current project is a Mellon-funded project that's focusing on food um, sovereignty, is um, that you can talk about the way in which colonization interrupted food systems. So for example, with the Navajo people that, um, and students who are often um, members of my classes, um, we can look at Kit Carson's interruption of the Navajo food system, where he rounded up Navajo people and took them down to Bosque Redondo, which was at, at the other southern end of the state, marched them and murdered them along the way, killed all their sheep, killed all of their um, animals, and took them away from their fields and their seeds, and then put them in this place where they were literally interned. And you can look at the interruptions uh, in the food system from that time, which was around 1863, uh, to now when the Navajo people are eight times more likely 
to be infected or die from COVID-19 uh, because of food insecurities that still exist um, on the Navajo Nation. Um, and so um, my current food pro pro project is a melon funded project in which I'm working with the University of Texas at Arlington and four other universities around the world on a melon project to train early career scholars. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a network of scholars around the world that will be able to look from an interdisciplinary perspective that incor incorporates humanities methodologies into, into the research and into the teaching and into, um, into our knowledge systems um, about the contributions of agriculture to climate change, but also how we can address these, um, how we can address these uh, problems that we're seeing around the world. So what we want to do as a result of um, our work is we want to be able to teach our students and teach early career scholars how you go about designing the future of food. Um, if we have problems now, if we have food deserts now, then how will we design, um, you know, a more just and equitable food system in the future, especially in arid regions. And we're particularly working most closely with our colleagues at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, looking at arid uh, regions, Arizona is an arid, arid region, and how we will have a just food system, say, in, by 2050. So that's my current work right now, looking at food and thinking about the ways we can teach environmental justice through food and food justice. Jody, I was reading some of the questions. Um, I think that you're actually better to answer some of these questions about um, teaching politically charged material and you know things like that. Because you talked a little bit about teaching in a red state. I, and I, I don't teach in a red state, but you know, in the climate, I will say that even in California, um, my campus has been very siloed. Um, we have a lot of environmental majors who graduate and become staff at agencies, work in private companies, work as engineers and consultants, and they have no um, academic training or any introduction to environmental justice. And I think actually pedagogically, if that's irresponsible, you know, because why would you do this whole teaching and then send people out in the world and their very first introduction is going to be at a contentious public hearing? Do you know what I mean? I don't think that's good education. You know, environmental justice, at least in California, exists in the world outside of the, the university. And so I, I've been very struck to see that there are more and more students that are coming and demanding this. And part of it has to do with the transformation of the students becoming more diverse, more students from community colleges. And, you know, they're coming in and they think that they're going to, you know, do these things and they want to do transformative things. And then they just hit up against, you know, uh, a mainstream um, curriculum that doesn't even acknowledge that environmental justice exists. And so I've been very struck to see how over time the students have organized um, to push um, the faculty within the mainstream fields um, to hire uh, environmental justice scholars who are also engineers um, and environmental scientists. And so, you know, I think this question of change and institutional culture, um, I think what you do is you, you know, for me at least, just from my experience, you know, you just do what you do. And sometimes the world changes around you. You know, I think the, the, like you said about the demand, the increasing demand for environmental studies. I mean, students know they are growing up climate, uh, knowing about climate change, terrified of it and, and angry and, you know, about all kinds of very real things, violence, climate change, authoritarianism, and so I think, you know, for me, you just do the work and then you create the spaces for collaboration and you, you build in, um, you know, the, the material and you share some of the old stuff and also what people are doing. And, you know, that's how you change, you know, you change cultures over time. And so I think, you know, that I don't know, though, about, you know, what it's like to um, maybe you have some of those thoughts. Uh, Joni, with the Q&A. 
um, comments. Maybe, yeah, this is a good time for us to break up into a larger Q&A. The, the wonderful thing about this format is not only how many people are here as part of this conversation um, and in how many places, I hope, we'll find out, um, but also that we're already getting questions. So um, some of them are coming through. If you um, aren't as familiar with Zoom, if you look towards the bottom of the screen and you see that Q&A, you can put a question in there um, with your profile or anonymously. Um, they'll come to us. My job is to try to collect these together and Giselle and I will sort of bat those around and um, Joni and Julie have already been, um, been addressing those and there are a number of different ones. There are a couple questions so I'll just consolidate these about what it means to think in different disciplines and particularly um, sort of for students and professors in the sciences really trying to get at these questions um, but also without um, shutting down a conversation that might seem too politically charged or too intense. There are also some similar questions about the different states or different political places we might ask these questions. So maybe we can start there. It's something that um, Julie was just sort of alluding to and Joni, I think you probably have, have things to say here. Um, well, I'll just jump in and I, I'll call attention to the fact that Julie uses keywords in each of her um, chapters. So um, the, the chapters are organized around particular keywords. And I found in my career here at ASU where we have been taking down silo for something like 15, 16 years, that the most difficult thing um, it, as far as working interdisciplinarily has been f discovering that you're not always using the keywords in the same way. So maybe the keyword is Anthropocene, or maybe the keyword is environmental studies, or maybe the keyword is um, democracy. It, it's interesting that it, it, we, what we find is that people are often using keywords in different ways depending on your discipline. And so one of the things you can do when you come together um, early in a, a sort of team-oriented uh, space is you can, you can quote unquote, norm your keywords. You can say, well, this is the way we're using the word Anthropocene, and this is the way we're using the word Anthropocene. And you know, what, what, what do we bring to the table? What do we contribute in this conversation about the Anthropocene that maybe you, know, you haven't thought about in your discipline, or maybe I haven't thought about in mine? Um, so there's that. But also at ASU, one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is um, innovate this this space that we're calling the humanities lab. Uh, because humanists tend not to work in quote unquote laboratory spaces. And so we're trying to innovate the ways in which two professors from two different disciplines, one in the humanities, one outside of the humanities, would come together and teach in a sort of solution question oriented space to really, really um, figure out how, how you can work together across the discipline. There was also, um, I mean, I think, you know, there's lots of questions um, and a couple of them were talking about, you know, the perception of bias. I mean, I think that where, you know, there's different things like there's polarization and hyper polarization right now um, in the, you know, in the US, but there's also like, I think there's also an urgency that maybe people who five years ago were like, well, I'm not going to talk about this because it seems political, like the, the reality of where we're at, especially with climate is forcing that to the front. And so people who like five years ago were like, well, I'm not sure I wanna you know, really deal with that. I mean, I think that not dealing with it because you're afraid of you know, bias perception is, is political. That's a political act, you know what I mean? And so I, I go back to the, like, this is, this is good pedagogy, like because you're preparing people to go out into the, the world again, you know, the world is changing around us. So I don't even know if that argument still, you know, holds. like, you know, because of what's happening, um, you know, at, at, at other kind of political scales. Um, but I think the other question I wanted to um, respond to live rather than in question is someone was saying about hope and how do you not get depressed and anxious? Well, I mean, I think that a lot of people um, feel that you know, I was watching this video this morning about decarbonization, you know, and, and it's that, that feeling, like you feel, you know, the, the dread and the, the anxiety and, you know, that we're all living it every single day, 
also, you know, with what's happening in other non-environmental spheres, but which are also connected, you know, around political authoritarianism, violence, um, reactions um, to protests and so on. But anyway, what I was going to suggest for some people is that this book has been really helpful for me. Um, it's by my colleague, um, Sarah Jaquette Ray, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, where she talks about the importance of like feeling the of acknowledging and thinking about affect and emotion and grief and how we can if we just kind of act like that's not real that's not really gonna that's gonna help us that doesn't help anybody you just get caught in sort of a nihilistic spiral of inaction because the scale of the problem is too large and i think for me whenever i start to feel like this i i go back to the the organizers and activists and the movements you know, and think that in the face of extreme violence, state sanctioned violence, extra legal violence, you know, communities, tribes, people, they, they just, they don't just roll over and die. You know, there isn't this like, woe is me, you know. So for me, whenever I start to feel myself slide into that, you know, I just remember the organizers and how they find meaning in the fight because the stakes are that high and because the issues are that important. So that, that kind of also answers your question, Giselle, of what I'm working on, is that I think I will spend the rest of my career doing the same thing that I've done since the start of my, my career, which is you know, working with environmental justice movements, um, doing work that is important to movements and with movements and for movements, um, and thinking right now about where hope where, where can we get a non-naive radical hope? And what does that mean? What does that look like? What is freedom? What, is, what are we free? What are we, when we say like we wanna degrowth, that was a question, and decarbonize and demilitarize and decolonize. Like these aren't just like, like buzzwords, like to really think about what those means and what are the fundamental conditions that they're responding to around questions of like big questions, big historical questions, but we're in a moment where those big historical questions are like foregrounded. How can we not think about them and be part of that, that those fights? I think that's what, um, that's where I'm kind of at. I, I acknowledge that I feel like that sometimes, like depressed and, you know, was, you know watching anything about, you know, the, the carbon, you know, and three degrees and so on is terrifying. Living through wildfires right now, you know, not being able to go outside, you know, the, the, the stuck inside because of the pandemic can't go outside because of the wildfires, you know. But then also you can see after the pandemic, what the pandemic did was blow it out, right? The arguments that transition wasn't possible because we couldn't afford it. Do you know what I mean? And then there was trillion dollar bailouts that were unjustly given as corporate bailouts. You know, there still isn't a stimulus for average people. So what I think it does is that there's this opening where the system as it is, is falling apart. And that's terrifying. But it's also like, okay, you know, you're, you have to have that, like that Gramscian thing about, you know, the old world is dying, the new world is not yet born, we're in the moment of monsters, you know, I think that's, that's where we're at. And so we can cry. And sometimes I often cry every day, because I'm so, I'm scared. And I, I am fearful on so many levels, but then you have to just go back and think, what are, what are the movement people doing? And what can I do? to be part of this movement, other movements for justice. That's how I feel. And, and I'll just add that it, it's often really helpful to read memoirs of Grace Lee Boggs or, you know, Wangari Maathai. Um, and, and I require my students to read, read books like that because then you see how, what people do to, to you know, to, to have an, uh, you know, an unnaive hope, you know, 
radical hope is do, doing. And again, just to go back to my example of food justice, I'll say that one of the things that gives, I think, my students hope is just doing something, whether that's knowing where your food comes from or actually you know, helping to produce your food, you're moving your body. You're literally like doing something with your body. So I think part of, part of radical hope can be making sure that you're not just intellectualizing everything but that you're doing something, whether it's just cooking a meal or planting a seed um, or just going to the grocery store uh, and, and consciously choosing you know, what, what you do in that space. But again, like I said, the memoirs, they're invaluable, they change lives. Hmm. This is a great, oh, Jello, please. Two questions that I asked. One was what you guys are doing now and then uh, my second question was, how do you teach hope to students uh, because of this feeling of despair among students, especially when they take a class on environmental justice? So uh, thank you for answering those questions. And uh, Joe, please go ahead. Oh, no, uh, no, I was also feeling the same way. And I was so struck, Julie, in your book, that quote from also the quote from Jan, uh, uh, Gramsci about forward dreaming, you know, not to ignore the kind of intensities or the traumas of the past or even the present, but still to retain, retain a capacity for forward dreaming. I thought it was such a sort of beautiful phrase um, for what you're both talking about, which is tied to this question about um, how we're feeling now, right? Um, and uh, a question that I asked my Environmental Studies 100 students that I was asked when the first time I taught the course, is everything going to be okay? Sort of checking in on questions like that, that's actually really important um, and, and hard to do because the answers are intense and complex. Um, but I also, I love that both Joni and Julie have tried to, uh, turned to something a number of our sort of questioners are interested in. Um, in the questions that were pre-asked through the registration po um, process, perhaps the most eloquent one was, um, what can I do? And I also want to just give a quick shout out before I turn that back to, and of course, Joni's already started answering that question, but um, before we turn back to that, um, I want to give a shout out to um, Jordan Connerty, who just wrote into the Q&A, um, who has 15 high school environmental studies students from Central Illinois tuning in. Thank you and welcome. We're really happy you're here. Um, and the question is, um, to our panelists, if you might speak to any ecological practices you're pursuing in your lives to mitigate problems brought on by this unjust, systemic injustices you're highlighting tonight. So clearly food practice is a really important part of that for Joni, but I'd love for uh, jo Joni and Julie both to jump in if, the, if you wanna say a little more there. Well, well, I'll just say that one of the things that we're doing in our, in our humanities labs is we're doing um, something that, that was called for in you know, the future we want, the 20, 2012 um, sustainability conference, the future we want, um, sort of projecting towards those 2050 goals that we need to re reach uh, in, in order to have a habitable, habitable planet. We're engaging and learning how to do what's called participatory design or scenario planning so, you know, if you want to have a habitable, plan, habitable planet in 2050, you'll have to plan for that. And so how do you plan for that? One of the ways, uh, one of the tools that we're learning how to use is, is participatory design, where you bring people from all walks of the community together. So if it's a, in a food system, you bring farmers, you bring, uh, uh, you know, uh, food market people together, you bring urban planners together with academics and students. And uh, we, have, we, have a, we have a site on our uh, Humanities for the Environment project uh, uh, called Dinner 2040, where we're planning what dinner in Maricopa County, which is one of the driest counties in, in North America, will look like in 2040 and then 2050. How do we plan for, instead of just letting things happen, how do we plan for? And again, this is doing. It's literally invo involving your body, whether it's taking it, taking your body to a, a meeting to sort of meet with other people and and plan for the future, or cooking a dinner. So um, yeah, I recommend um, that instead of that, that we purposely learn how to how to you know forward dream. That's a really beautiful um, example. And I, I learned a lot from it. Um, I think, you know, the question of what can we do? I mean, I think that we, we can do things and then we have to 
go outwards because you know we know that 71 percent of emissions are from 100 uh, 100 companies you know and really it's drills down it's 20 corp corporations and i forget the exact number of people so we can do all we want and still we also have to be facing outward and pushing supporting this idea of um of keeping it in the ground you know no more fossil fuels like, what does that actually mean? And I think that, you know, I, I really um, am, I'm really, uh, lear I learn a lot from learning history that I'm not directly, like I'm not a historian of abolition of slavery, but understanding how abolitionism, you know, evolved over time and how the common sense shifts. You know, I have a story in um, the book where I talked about um, Benjamin Lay, the, the Quaker vegetarian dwarf, who basically, you know, we, we know Quakers are, are, were start ardent abolitionists, but they didn't, there's no reason why they, they had to be pushed that way. And they had to be pushed by people like Benjamin Lay. And, you know, he had, he had a, a performative politics and a belief in, you know, how you live and how, you know, that it was wrong for Quakers to own slaves, you know, and this was a, a hundred years before they, you know, they decided this was their, their position. Do you know what I mean? And so I think um, learning, reading people's stories, but learning histories is also really helpful. And I think a lot of those stories are focused on institutions, but then also micro practices. So Benjamin Lay, wanted, he never got on a horse. He walked everywhere. He made all his own food. He lived in a cave. You know, people thought he was like a nut or butter, you know? And so I'm not saying we all have to be like that because those are also like stereotypes of environmentalists, you know, but I think that we can, we can do things and we have to keep the big picture, you know. So for me, learning about those people um, who are doing that now, but then also in the past makes me feel like, you know, I, I can be connected to a, a longer arc of um, a justice struggle, of which environmental justice is one part of a broader struggle um, for justice and freedom. So, um, um, oh, yeah. please jump on in. No, I just see a very important question that is in the chat. Uh, I want to read it because maybe uh, you guys are interested in answering. Uh, someone says, Arlene uh, says, there is so much misinformation and competing misinformation out there. What are your suggestions for helping folks who haven't thought about environmental justice to do so? Read, read Julie's new book. Seriously, it's, it's 100 pages long. It's very accessible. It's this really wonderful, uh, you know, crystallization of the environmental justice movement. But, but despite being short, it doesn't leave anything out. And so uh, that's, that's one thing that I would suggest. I'm just really impressed with Julie's new book. So I would suggest that. And I would say just find out who are your local, because um, environmentalism, broadly environmental justice is always about scale and scale simultaneously, you know, so it's both very local, but then also very networked. So a lot of the book looks at how, you know, Standing Rock folks were connected to folks in, you know, um, Puerto Rico and, you know, Standing Rock folks, were, you know, had delegations from all around the world of, of people fighting similar, you know, struggles. And so um, environmental justice is always local, but then network and not just in a national you know, sense. And so I think it's important to find out who are the people who work on environmental justice and what are they working on? What are the campaigns they're working on? And then, you know, uh, I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, maybe passe, but, you know, we have elections in November, you know what I mean? Again, at multiple scales and the stakes of which are gigantic, enormous, um, like potentially, you know, um, groundbreaking historically in the U.S. And so I think we have to really be involved in, in those, you know, however that looks, you know, without, you know, um, being overt about what that, that means. But, you know, thinking about um, what it means to have another, you know, four years of an oil and gas um, driven climate policy slash non-policy. 
Um, and so I think, you know, that those are very real questions. Um, and, you know, we, you can work on there's all the scales that you feel comfortable with, with but, but choose, choose something. I, I would agree with that. I mean, I began my, my history at, by, by noting that I, everything, everything I've done extends from the, the legacy of one, one activist, well, more than one activist, but Teresa Leal in Nogales, Arizona, but she was influenced by the Zapatistas and they were influenced by indigenous movements all throughout North and South America for 500 years before and, and since. And so, yeah, checking out your local, your local, um, um, the people that work on the local level and then uh, figuring out what the connections are from there. So here we are, an incredibly rich conversation for this past hour. Um, and it's probably just to be respectful of everyone's times and all the Zooming that's happening everywhere. Um, I wanna sort of close off um, with some thank yous and just a few words about some things that are um, to come. First off, thank you so much, Julie and Joni, for this magnificent conversation and engagement and for Gisela for putting this all together. And again, for being the person to sort of anchor environmental justice in our ENTS curriculum. I'm really grateful for that. Um, I just want to say a few words and I'm putting now in the sort of chat which we uh, should post to everyone who's attending um, and not just the panelists um, some links about some things that are coming up um, and that are that are really important um, so first off, um, next up for Planet Now, um, September 28 at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, we'll be talking about the inequities of urban heat with Lad Keith in conversation with, um, with my colleagues here at Rice, uh, uh, Reeve Taylor and Richard Johnson. Um, we're gonna have the inaugural Walter Isle um, talk with Ayanna Elizabeth Johnston, uh, excuse me, Johnson on October 12th at 6 p.m. What is climate justice now? And she works sort of beautifully across the sciences and public policy and with interests because this is so important to me as well um, in um, the arts and literature and manages to sort of put it all together. Um, so I think that's going to be a really exciting event. Um, Giselle will be back with us for our Colleges of the Global South November 2nd at 6 p.m. And then we'll close out our series for the fall with a session called Caribbean Ecologies, a way of introducing the work, and it's a sort of faculty spotlight of Jacqueline Couty in, the in, in, in French, who is also in the Department of Modern and Classical Literatures and Cultures. And we're so excited to have an incoming postdoc um, who did her uh, degree in cultural studies at Davis, as I recall, um, Sophie Sapmore, who will also be teaching environmental justice courses in the spring and be with us for a couple of years. We're really, really excited about about that. Um, and I should also give a shout out for a couple other events in the humanities. Jacqueline Couty, who I mentioned um, moments ago, um, an event on September 25th at four called Race and Policing. And if you follow these links, you'll get to, um, you will uh, sort of get to the to, to the to the right place to register for that um, and then and and uh, then finally um, the School of Humanity Humanities and since this has come up in just just now reflections on the 2020 election with Douglas Brinkley on October 1st at 4 p.m. and then also Julie just asked me to post some links and I am putting those in now and someone will tell me if they don't appear oops no it's they're not appearing. Um, I will sort of put those in the links for everyone too. Um, we're so excited that you all joined us tonight um, and we're looking forward to more conversations to come. So thanks so much um, and please have a good night and stay safe and healthy. Mm -hmm.